Hello and welcome to the Cinema Savvy Movie Podcast, the channel for film reviews, discussions and everything in between. I'm Chris Garner, joined with my co-host George Aldridge, and we've got a very, very exciting show for you here today. We'll be bringing you our in-depth review of Mad Max Fury Road, which I know was one of our most anticipated movies of the year for both of us. Later on in the show, we'll have our second instalment of Film Fights, but first up, we've got our week in movie news. So George, what have we got? So the first bit of news came out earlier today. Uh, the name for the final, not final for sure, the third Planet of the Apes film is going to be called War of the Planet of the Apes. Of the redemption, <laughs> of the ending of... Um, yeah, I think as titles go, it's not far from what we expect from these films really, and judging from the ending of Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, this definitely seems the way that the third one was going to be tied up. Yeah, this was inevitable, I thought. At the end of the second one, they kind of got the big war, like, oh, they're coming, so this kind of has to happen, and the film, I think, has to end with the humans in the cages, so it will be interesting to see what happens. Hopefully it closes off a trilogy, but it wouldn't surprise me if they make a few more. With the um, th- with the direction they've gone with Caesar, it'll be interesting to see whether by the end of the film he has to imprison humans because throughout these two films he's always had um, compassion for humans. So, I mean, with the second film we had our antagonist with Cobra wanting to enslave humans and we got our introduction to that. But it'll be interesting to see which direction they go because this will be the last ditch effort of the humans to try and get rid of the apes once and for all. Obviously, they're not going to win, but it depends on what means. I think that Caesar will probably die in this one, and then if they do carry on the series, it will either be with his son or with a new character. Yeah, I think Circus is getting big directing, so I think Caesar was naturally going to get killed off. I thought it happened in the second one, in all honesty, mm. and it almost did, spoiler. Yeah. But I think the third one, it will round out the Caesar trilogy, and if you have his death, then all the apes will rise together and you kind of get the immortal Caesar which they speak about in the future films so that's the only way I can see it successfully working and I, I would actually quite like to see a new take on the dystopian planet of the apes timeline which if they get to that eventually I like this prequel trilogy set in a few years after our current time but it would be nice to see in which direction they would take it if they did ch- choose to go like hundreds of years into the future or whatever they do with it Yeah, I think it'd be pretty cool the way they do it, as long as there's no dodgy things like the Michael... Not Michael Bay, um... The Tim Burton. That's the one, I don't know how I got them wrong. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'd like to see the world, I want to see the humans in cages, the civilization of the apes. But it would just be very weird going from the apes that don't speak much to suddenly these tribes and stuff. Well, I I thought it, it was quite a natural progression between the first film and the second film in terms of... The, um, the apes dialogue they were talking more but it was still very um, I don't want to say realistic but it was still very much believable in what they'd set up since the first one yeah that's that was one of the strong points it's just you know 200 to 300 years down the line they will be speaking naturally and obviously humans have lost the voices so mm. it's just if they were to keep it in the same series to leap to that would be stupid however they left it 10-15 years and that's more believable I'd much rather they close off the trilogy and you've got your great prequels for the first ever time mm. well you know I'm hopeful for it I mean they're, they're two for two at the minute I love both of the ones yeah. that have come out before um, so I hope it doesn't do what most trilogies do and end on a real whimper but we'll have to wait and see definitely close to a perfect trilogy our next bit of news is that the actor Diego Luna has joined the Star Wars Rogue One cast um, I don't know much about this guy. I think you've seen something he's in, so why don't you take this one? Yeah, he was in Elysium. It, it wasn't a major role, it was mine. I think he's the guy that gives Matt Damon the exoskeleton, mm. who's kind of this leader of a little cult. I'm not really bothered about that aspect. What I find interesting is that this must be one of like, the first like, Latino actors to be cast in Star Wars. Mm, and they're definitely pushing for more diversity now as well exactly is only, is only a good thing with Star Wars exactly that's the main thing I've picked up from this casting news but I think they know what they're doing casting wise they haven't made many mistakes so far we haven't seen a lot but I think it's going to pay off and I've got a lot of hopes for this spin-off film mm. I mean I, I saw Elysium I only saw it the once uh, when it came out um, I kind of went off the District 9 hype 
and just checked it out. I didn't think it was that great, but it wasn't as bad as some people say it was. No, but I just thought it was mostly kind of forgettable, really. But I don't remember um, Diego Luna in it, so I don't remember the actor. I remember the character, but it this mm. seems an odd one because I thought it was visually spectacular. And uh, but then you know um, Neil Blomkamp criticised. It says his script weren't good enough. Blah blah blah. So I think they picked up off their mistakes. But I, I still enjoyed it. It's just a just a summer blockbuster in its own right. I, it was still interesting. I, I enjoyed it, but it, it wasn't on the level of District 9, which is what everyone already knows. And you know, it's it's Star Wars going with mostly unknowns as well. He's not... I don't know if he'll be a main character or a, probably a supporting character. But th- um, it, it's nice that they're pushing for unknown talent or lesser known talent. Yep, and that's sticking to the original way of Star Wars. Oh, yeah. I mean, even the prequels, you had a few names, but... Um, you and McGregor, like, you and McGregor yeah. was only off the back of Train Spot, and he still wasn't a big name. Liam Neeson was probably the, your biggest name from that movie. Yeah, I, I think so. Definitely. I mean, Ian McDermott was a theatre actor alongside a lot of them. Yeah, so you had Samuel Jackson as well, but that 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 was more. Or I think that was more for the sequels and for Samuel L. Yeah. Jackson's own pleasure. But yeah, as long as they stick to stuff like this, I think the new cast again is going to be outstanding. But I have a feeling that Diego Luna will be part of the Central Three for the spin-off. Because I assume that's how they'll do it. And speaking of spin-offs, um, a new X-Men spin-off has been confirmed called The New Mutants, which will be directed by Josh Boone, who directed The Fault in Our Stars. Um, I'm really not sure what to make of this one. I Personally, I don't think X-Men needs a spin-off. And... We, we're kind of getting two. I mean, we're getting a Gambit film, we're getting a Deadpool film, and X Men is ongoing anyway. It's not like X Men's gonna end after Apocalypse. It's still gonna continue in some way or another. So I just don't see the need to do this. No, not at all. I mean, it's it's a film called like New Mutants, but it's that's just X Men. A group yeah, of mutants exactly. is X Men. It's yeah. just a different class. Call it X Men Different Class. It's just stupid, and it's well, unnecessary. You know, you know, a while back there was um, an X Men TV show confirmed that they're working on. To me, this just the name of it sounds more like a TV spin-off. Yeah, it does. It's just. Oh, tr- I don't see this being a successful film franchise, especially because X Men's continuing. Like, I don't. Why do you need the two? Oh, I don't know. It seems like a kind of desperate ditch effort to compete with Marvel and all the other tie-in and spin-offs that one that company's got I don't think it'll work though Fox oh no they fixed themselves on X-Men but they'd already dug themselves the hole they just shouldn't do it again which I fear they're going to do but we'll just stick with it and praise that it's not that bad I mean they were talking of doing an X-Men and Fantastic Four crossover but I think they've backed out of that now I don't know if that's because the Fantastic Four's rumoured to be quite terrible. It's had a really, really troubled production. So maybe this is their other take on doing a spin-off film? Um, I don't don't know. Well, we'll have to find out. But we also got another bit of X-Men news as well, if you want to go into that. Yeah, so James McAvoy is playing Professor X, who is famous for being bold. And it's only took them three films to make him bold. (laughs) <laughs> that's the news. That, that's how <laughs> that's how bad this week's news has been. Yeah, it's been really. This is probably the slowest week in movie news I can remember, honestly. I think so. I mean, about a month ago, we had like eight trailers in like four days, and now we've gone to this talking about someone shaving his head. Yeah, and he, I mean, what else can you say? It'll be interesting to see what James McAvoy will look like with a shaved head. I mean, Patrick Stewart. We were kind of used to it anyway. Yeah, Patrick Stewart was, you know, Picard. So you're like, oh, it's it's him. He's, he, yeah. he actually looks exactly like he does in the comics where you've got James McAvoy, who I still wouldn't take seriously about her. Yeah. And so so they'll, they'll probably write that into the script where... Well, I hope they explain why he's lost his hair. I hope but I hope Deadpool comes in and makes a joke about it. So you said this two films ago. That, that'll probably be later down the line, though, because I don't think Deadpool's going to be an apocalypse, is he? He he won't be. He's not written down to be. However, I'm gonna keep my head up and hope he is. Just even for a minute will do. But I I, I doubt it. It'd just be very funny to see him taking the piss out of the X Men franchise, which I think. Well, I mean, do. they'd ha- they'd have time to like do an after credit scene or something, definitely, because Deadpool comes out February, doesn't it? And then yeah, 
so Deadpool is just before Apocalypse. Mm. But I think if you put Deadpool in the Apocalypse, Deadpool so overpowered he'd have to win, so they wouldn't do anything. Oh, yeah. And then we've had... Um, you can go into this one too if you want, because um, you found a scoop that just came out earlier today, actually, of the new rumoured actor to be playing Spider-Man. Yeah, um, so there was a short list a few weeks ago of like five of them. The only name on there was Azza Butterfield, who was in Boy in the Striped Pajamas, Hugo and Ender's Game. He's a good young actor, he's got a big career ahead of him. And I forgot the name of the guy on Twitter, it's like, he, he, all I know is that he works for Latino movies or something like that. And he's about 80% spot on with his Marvel scoops, he doesn't post it unless he's confident. Obviously this is just speculation, there's a good chance he's wrong. But considering he, Butterfield's on the shortlist, I think he will, I think he's got the part. Again, I, I don't agree with the way they're doing the new Spider-Man as a 15-year-old. Because they're saying he doesn't have an origin, but you know he will because he's that young. Oh yeah, and I, I'm I'm right there with you. I don't think they should go this young with Spider-Man. Um, we've had Tobey Maguire, we've had Andrew Garfield, both of which were much older than you know in teenage, and we still believe that they well maybe not so much uh, Spider-Man two perhaps, but we believe that they were that age. Andrew Garfield looked the part and say what you want about the Amazing Spider-Man films, he was probably the strongest point of that film with Emma Stone. Um, but I think Marvel will be looking for longevity with this Spider-Man. Especially, they'll be moving into Phase 4, they'll be looking for new superheroes to helm the new team going forward, and obviously Spider-Man for ages was the poster child of Marvel. And then, since then, he's had a few bad films, he's kind of dropped off out of the limelight a bit, Iron Man's took over and the rest of the Avengers. So I think Marvel will be trying to big up Spider-Man again to continue Marvel in its next few phases, if it carries on. Yeah, I think they'll, they're will they going to try and make him the poster boy, but I think everyone's grown out of him. Mm. He's had two franchises, people want new stuff, and I think that's what... The excitement's around. I mean, it's it's going to be good. I'll make money at Spider-Man, but at the end of the day, I'm I'm more excited for other Marvel projects. Mm, definitely, but you know what? We'll we'll still go and see it, won't we? Oh yeah, even, obviously. <laughs> even yeah. Like, yeah. They, they they own wallets. Yeah, and honestly, that's about it for our movie news this week. Again, really slow week. With with, I'm sorry that we can't bring you more, but we can only report back on what's come out, and not much has come out. So. With all that said, why don't we get into our Mad Max Fury Road review? It is by my hand! You arise! From the ashes of this world! I want them back! They're my property! Oh, what a day! What a lovely day! We'll start off with a spoiler-free review. We'll let you know when we're moving into spoiler territory. Uh, both of us saw the film for the first time today. I saw it in a 3D showing, and you saw it in 2D, didn't you? Yeah, it was a film I was very excited about. So it was third on my anticipated list of 2015. Trailers were sensational, Yeah. and it was just great to see a new Mad Max film. Well, the trailers in themselves were just works of art. The editing and the music choice and the frantic pace of the shots used, it was just... Just the trailers were just a joy to watch in themselves, but this was my second most anticipated film of the year behind Star Wars Force Awakens, and why don't we start off with general impressions? I'm going to let you start off on this one, right. because I've got some stuff to say on this which might incur the wrath of many people. So, so I'm just going to start off, we haven't discussed at all our opinions, we said when we both saw it, I'm not going to say anything until we start chatting on the on this. Yeah, our only discussion for this has been breaking down the areas we want to hit for the review, and that's it. We haven't gone in-depth on anything, so this will be our first time speaking about it properly in-depth. 
I'm coming out and saying it. This is by far the best film of the year so far for me. Mm-hmm. This is one of the funnest. This is one of the funnest films I've had. And this is the best blockbuster since the Dark Knight, and will go down as one of the best action films of all time. That's my headline to it. Oh, that is that is serious praise right there. You're ranking this right up there with Dark Knight. Yep, and I just can't remember the last time I was watching something on screen like that, so mesmerised, and it was just watching it. It was so fun, and I just oh, yeah. felt like I was having a great time watching it. And I think the other people did around me. Oh, I just loved it, and I cannot wait to see this again on Tuesday. But as I've done my minor breakdown, I want to hear yours. Okay, well, you may have mistook my tone earlier for being really pessimistic with it, and that's not entirely the case. This, I will agree, this is the best film I've seen all year so far. It will probably be the best summer film, because, I mean, next we've got uh, Jurassic World coming out, Ant-Man, Terminator, whatever. This will just blow them out of the water. Um, It definitely met the hype I had with it I was I loved the film I was excited it kept me engaged all the way through it I um, I came out of it you know on a high everyone did in our screen they all seemed to really enjoy it the action was perfect but I just think the bits around the action in the film as in the characters the story and the character development were kind of lacking a little bit I would have liked a little bit more substance to it, or at least equal to that of some of the older Mad Max films. As such, I kind of had to critique this film on the concept that this is just an action film. This is just a loud, not dumb action, well, kind of dumb action film. Uh, That's all you're going in for. Switch the brain off, just enjoy it. Popcorn entertainment. But I kind of want more from my action films than that um, my favourite action movie of all time is Terminator 2 and you know that's got the perfect blend of of themes, of character of great action and characters and it all works so well this one had the great action I can't fault it for that but I just think everything around it was kind of lacking a little bit I can understand that and you're right about the action, the action's spot on and right, it's weaker parts are when there is no cars, when there is yeah. nothing, you have the the cast. I think I'm not going to delve into it yet, but the character of Furiosa is by far the best developed character, even better developed than I could be Max was in the first Mad Max film, anyway. Yeah. But it's the supporting cast where there's just a few characters like, oh, they're just there because they're there. What? Who is she? Who is he? Why is he suddenly that? Hmm. And it it just felt a week on a few of their moments. Um, obviously, I'll talk a lot more about this in the spoiler section. But I think I went to this film intending on watching the the fun action film, Mad Max two Mad Max two esque stuff like that. So I completely agree where that part comes out of it. But I think I went in there expecting this action masterpiece, and that's what I found from it. I mean, obviously, if you're going to critique a film, it's right to focus on the other stuff. Mm. But I think what I went in for, I was so like overwhelmed by it that I just don't care as much. I know that sounds like a really bad thing mm. to say, but I was just having so much fun. It just didn't affect my opinion of the film whatsoever because it's just not something I expected from a Mad Max film. And I mean, the trailers didn't misrepresent the film i mean all the trailers came out and it just looked like the film was a two hour long car chase across a desert which well it wasn't a two hour long one it was probably an, an hour and a half long one broken up with minor interludes of attempted character development and obviously you've got to have some talk in between characters but i don't want to i don't want to sound like i'm coming across that I'm, I'm bashing this film i'm not i mean the first hour, of the whole way through the film, really, I just had a, a beaming smile on my face just to witness this chaos of the action, and it's it's perfectly shot. I mean, I see some films, and I think, how can a human being physically make this? I mean, I had that with Lord of the Rings. I had that with this film. I, you just get caught up in the magic of the filmmaking and just all the effort that's been put into it. This... Out of all the Mad Max films, actually, this probably paints 
the most vivid representation of this world we've seen. Obviously now he's got more freedom to do with what he wants, he's got a higher budget, uh, technology is advanced since the original Mad Max film, so he can go a lot crazy with it, but it just makes such a difference when you watch this film and the artistry that's gone into it, you mean you've got the costumes which are fantastic, the the vehicle designs a fantastic just everything about this world it just fully immerses you into it and I went to see it with one of my friends who's never seen any of the original Mad Max films and he said that he was almost confused for the first 40 minutes because he hadn't been he hadn't been shown this world so he was trying to catch up to it whereas I just embraced every crazy whacked out design of of people of the machinery of whatever and i just in terms of world building this was the best one of the franchise oh for sure what one of the it's, it's it's in three words when i look at it you've got your original mad max i know they're all they're all different but i look at the originals as their own world but in the first 20 minutes when you are in in morton joe's town that looks like it's coming out of post-apocalyptic Nurse, if that's a real word, so you, you'd a bit get a bit of green grass stuff like that, and then you get taken into the the original wasteland. It's got its three world progress, and then what I found was that you've got this genius George Miller who essentially created this genre by itself. He mm. he just you know a, a low budget action film thirty five years ago, whatever it was, and he just you know created a masterpiece, and then he furthered it with the second one. The third one, he invented a bit more to it, but what he does in the fourth one was that you just demonstrate like how vivid his imagination is, the way that he's got this civilization, mm. and although that's there, he doesn't care. He wants to go back into the wasteland. That's why we're watching it. Yeah. But you're right, you're spot on with the costumes and the car designs. I mean, some of the car designs are insane. Like You'd think they were CGI, but I believe that most of them were actually proper oh, cars that were done up if not all of them were practical i mean there was some obviously this isn't a spoiler because this is in the trailer the um the sandstorm tornado sequence that was obviously cgi but in terms of the actual cars these are all cars that have been made and fashioned to look this way and just down to everything down to like every bolt every design there's some films where you you see the film and you know they bring out those concept art books or the art behind of whatever film it is. This would be one of those books I'd love to buy for this because when I first saw the trailer and you had the line come up in the trailer from the mastermind George Miller, I was like, really? Is he a mastermind? I mean, he's made the first three Mad Max films, sure, but besides that, he hasn't really done much else to merit the title of mastermind from this film he earns that title without a doubt all this stuff all this imagine imaginative world and the characters and the just completely crazy designs all came from the imagination and mind of one man that's a mastermind that is exactly what i was leading on to say the trailers they just had from the masterminds like yeah he's he's created it but then it's from this one you're like oh my word just from each tribe is their own their cars are different and then he's almost created each tribe oh, it's it's hard to explain it but it differs so much but the fact that this is the one guy that's created these looks I mean if you look within the tribe every they're all generic the same each one mm. but they each have their own individual look but within that individual look you have its own cars within that so it's almost Oh, do you know how, it's like a three layer process I, I... It, it's different yet similar yeah that, that's out, the one out of, out of all the three films this one reminded me the most of Road Warrior but with Road Warrior and we mentioned this in our Thunderdome review as well with Thunderdome they kind of took the things that worked in the second one and just repeated it all the people, the cars, the gangs looked identical to the second one this one gives you entirely new looks of, I mean, um, they're called the War Boys, I believe. You see them in the trailer, they're the guys um, painted white. Um, they're not like anything we've seen in the Mad Max universe, yet they feel so at home in this world. Yeah, and it's it's just the little things. When they're at the Citadel at the start, 
the way they they use the elevator is just the war boys like running on top of these wheels just to yeah. get the strength up. And it's like this is exactly what a Mad Max film should be. And each war boy, it's again, it's a uh, difference in repetition. They're all white with score faces, but then you introduce the characters that have got like scars going up them or just a few jagged uh, cuts on their lips. So even they're different from myself, just so you can separate them. But again, they all fit into the same category, and it's just like the cars. I mean, it's not a spoiler. You get the truck that's uh, chasing the the warbird, mm. and then it's covered in head to have spikes, and it just looks like impenetrable. And then you cut again, and it's a tiny little buggy that's the same spikes, but they, they just look different. They, they just don't. They're not the exact same purpose. It, they're there for different things. And you can tell each car apart and which tribe each one belongs to just based on the appearance of, you know, their vehicle, which, when I mean, these action scenes can get really chaotic, but you can still follow it. It's all shot in a way. It's not all super close-up shaky cam. If it does zoom in for a close-up, it's all done for a stylistic standpoint. We mentioned this in our um, earlier Mad Max reviews, where they speed up the footage... Oh, they there do this again. There were some shots in this where they do it again, and where, as in the original ones, it almost looked like they had to do that because they didn't have fast enough cars. With this, it's such a stylistic choice, and it's perfect. I mean, I, for the first... Well, all the way through the film, I was watching this film, and I kind of um, got the same feelings I did when I watched Lord of the Rings, in that I'm looking at this world just thinking, I could watch a four-hour-long movie just in this world just in the citadel at the start every detail i was just taking in each frame of the film like it was a painting it was beautiful and there was always something going on um as we said the set design phenomenal and it just goes to show what a difference practical effects make to a movie it may be tough it may be arduous the director may feel like it nothing's coming together i mean i know this film had a really troubled production I mean, I think they had to delay the shoot almost like half a year due to bad storms and stuff like that. But it's films like this when the effort finally pays off and it's the result you get and it's just it's just perfect. Yep, and it's what you were saying about each frame is almost a painting. When we're introduced to the Citadel, you've got maybe eight different shots all combined and there was like the one of like the, the women uh, breastfeeding the milk and giving it to yeah. like the really big hulking guy and like you know although this is like two three seconds long this is so bizarre but so like wonderful at the same time Mm. and then it would cut to the war boys in their room like chasing for the wheels and it's it was just incredible watching it and it does a great job of building that civilization too i mean they're they treat the villain almost like a godlike figure and they're they're grabbing all these steering wheels from like a mountain a mountain of steering wheels and praying that they'll I believe they say ride into the gates of Valhalla or something like yeah. that. So with this one, we I don't want to say they've become more civilized, but um, we don't know how long the world's been like this, but we get the sense that they've had to do their best to create the civilization they physically can and it's it's more apparent in this one than it is in the previous Mad Max films I found. Yeah, you get the the subtle hints of civilization that everyone's uniting together at the bottom to try and get the water. And then it's it's similar to the third one because in Thunderdome mm. you actually have your first batch of civilization with your multiple leaders, stuff like that. And I think it's the setting of this is we'll talk about it far more later, but this is from George Miller set between the second and third film I think that's mainly so you don't have like an older Mad Max but yeah. with this you just have your early hints that you're right about in Morton and Joe they see him as a god I see him as a more of a dictator who's in control because the ending which we'll discuss more later on indicates that they're happy Um, and I, you're right again I, I want to spend more than two three hours here I could I could see so many films Mm. There's so much to explore. I mean, in the old films, you don't have tribes like against each other. You kind of just have this gang and these people living there. That's what they always essentially were. 
whereas in this you're introduced to neighbouring tribes and oh you're in our area so now we're going to get you and you know which is which all again because of the costumes because of the cars you can always tell which is which yeah as you were saying like in the other Mad Max films it seemed like every gang was out for itself or even Barter Town was very much a secluded town in this one and this isn't really a spoiler you've um You've got three towns that all neighbour each other. You've got um, there's Gas Town, Bullet Farm, and the Citadel, and each one shows the commodities that people need now. You've got Gas Town for the vehicles, you got bullets for your artillery, and you got water. They're the three things you need to survive in this new world, and each one is given such a defining look. And what I love about this one is that this is back to the tone we wanted and that we should have got with Beyond Thunderdome. This is back to the Mad Max we know and love but there's... I, I will go and say that this is a reboot, we'll get into this later because I know we've talked about briefly about our debate between that but it's it's familiar enough but yet it's different for this new audience and obviously this this is going to make a killing at the box office I think personally um, we're going to get sequels to explore this world more and that's only a good thing in my opinion it's it's good to get sequels I want sequels as long as they're done right like this and they're, oh, definitely. they're taken in the right direction and it's not backwards in any way which leads us on to the character of Max Yeah. and I know that you've got a few well I believe it's minor issues with Tom Hardy um there's a bit with his backstory which I'll get into in our spoiler section because I don't want to like taint anyone's perceptions with that. But with Tom Hardy, my my main problem with this was that he wasn't he really wasn't the protagonist of this movie. Now I've seen people argue that even in all of the other films he's a smaller part of a bigger story, which yeah that's true. But even so you still follow his character through it all. And I felt there were times in this movie where we wouldn't see him for so long or we'd get such a minor glimpse of him that I'd completely forget he was in this movie or that he was the guy we were meant to be following who's our eyes through to this world. Because really, this is Charlize Theron's movie, um, Furiosa. I mean, the story revolves around her and her mission um, she gets the most screen time out of anyone. If with a few minor rewrites to this script, you could have easily have lifted Max out of this story entirely and just had it about Furiosa. You could have, but at the end of the day, this is still Max's story. Not to tell, but the film doesn't work without Max. And I get what you mean completely with Furiosa. She's just leading the women who want to escape from Morton Joe because they're only there to have his children because he wants a boy it's fairly simple, it's not a spoiler it's just the plot and then Furios is just there on this mission to try and save them and you're right, I mean, she's such a badass and she's not sticking to the convention of a, a sort of American blockbuster woman character the way you say it mm. you get a lot of feminists that will moan about, oh my god, they're just there to be looked at not male gaze or that sort of nonsense um, with this one you just get this like hard up character I mean she's got one arm for a start but she's just got this like it's, it's almost just this like it's almost like a transformer isn't it when you look at the new hand she has yeah yeah it kind of reminded me of um, sort of edge of tomorrow mech suit sort of hands yeah and it, yeah. it was essentially just this like mech hand and right when, you're in, when you see this woman character with that you're like oh this isn't going to stick to the conventions of your standard blockbuster. And then, as the film grows with her, you kind of see that she's this like badass that you haven't really seen on screen before, where she's got, um, she knows how to fight, she does it with Max, she has the, the on her truck, she's one of the only drivers, I mean, uh, what's, what's the actual name of her character? Because before it's Furiosa, she has a role, doesn't she? Um... um. On her credits, I've just got an Imperator. That's it. Imper Furiosa. Imperator. I believe that's what they call her. Because her mission is essentially to go and get the petrol, but she has her detour. Mm. And she's all, before we even meet her, she's seen as this really important character to Immortan Joe. 
and as she just goes away you think right this isn't sticking to the formula this is going to be an interesting character let's see what else it does and this is almost like a feminist film in it's not in an offensive way at all mm. it's the perfect way of writing women characters in blockbusters and I think they've kind of needed it because the only one I can ever think of is Black Widow but then again now nowadays they just moan saying she's caught up in love stories which is severely unfair but you just kind of look at look at it as a whole the blockbuster genre and oh there's Katniss Everdeen but she's only there for a love triangle where you just have this Furiosa who doesn't care about men anything she probably wants them all dead well it, it's not a big concern in this world like quite frankly in the in the tone they set and I mean you completely get behind her as a complete badass I mean Charlize Theron is a, a fantastic actress. I didn't like the film Prometheus, but I thought she was great in it, and she's kind of a very similar character in that she's very commanding. She's almost not a general, but she's a leader of people, and she's active. And these are the kind of female characters that I like. I mentioned this before in our, in one of our other reviews where I brought up Princess Leia. Characters, strong female characters that start out strong and continue to be all the way through those are the best female characters in any film and it's nice to see that and I think Star Wars will definitely capitalise on this when it comes out um, bringing female leads or just characters in general into their blockbuster films and it's it's nice to see it. it's still not completely there yet but it's I think um, Hollywood is definitely moving that way yeah as Obviously, we'll be getting Captain Marvel and Wonder Woman, so I yeah. assume that's going to be the big shift. But if anything, Mad Max, you'll get a lot of writers now. They're going to look at that and think, "Oh, there is another way of writing these characters." I mean, Furiosa could easily be a man. I mean, she's got short hair. Mm. There's no love triangle. She knows how to use a gun. They could have easily written that as a man's role, but they're like, "No, actually, she'll be a woman. She'll be doing good for their gender." Especially in the outline of the film, saving all the other ones but it's, it's all about freedom isn't it because yeah. you know we're not things we're people yeah the, the the themes of this film are definitely freedom and hope really I mean that's what keeps all the characters moving whether that's for good or for bad and really there's two other characters that we can bring up we've got um, Nicholas Holt's character called Nux who surprisingly gets quite a lot of um, humanity given to him in this and a lot of screen time more than I expected from the trailer yeah, because, I mean, he's got the killer line. Everyone knows what line is. Oh, yeah. What a day, what a lovely day. And that that's going to be immortal. I think people will be saying that for years to come. Oh, it's such a great line. You, I, I, was, uh, I was telling you this before, but you know you've got a great line when it's so quotable before the film's even out. And he, that was one of them from the first trailer. Exactly, and I was just waiting for that to happen in the film. I think so, a lot of people will be. And when it finally came, it's like, yes, get in. Yeah, so... But it, it was an interesting character, I mean... He starts off as he starts off as one of the the, uh, the war boys, and it's it's hard to talk about him without spoilers. I'm not going to go into it, but he gets a lot of growth. He, he gets a yeah. lot of he get he has a character arc in in this film. I mean, as, as far as developing characters goes, we mentioned you mentioned that we didn't it didn't have a great deal of it, but I think f he is the one that does have the most growth mm. because Furiosa and Max they're already established as who they are within the first ten minutes. But he's the only character that transitions on the screen, and you can see it happening. And it's it's hard to explain it because I think that's going to have to be sp uh, spoken about in the spoiler section yeah. because it's. But with his with his character, it's he was the only person I really cared about out of everyone. Um, I would have liked to have seen more of this humanity given to Mad Max, perhaps, or a few times where he's showing. A little humanity. I know you could argue that this world has just completely drawn all that out of him. And there's a few nice scenes with Tom Hardy towards the end, but he's he's either hardly in this movie, hardly has any dialogue in this movie, or there's just times where you just completely forget he's in it. But Nicholas Holt's character is just perfect, and him and Charlize Theron are probably the two that get the most screen time in this film. Yeah, I think that's about right, to be fair, because he is in it a lot, and he starts off as a villain, as you can tell by the trailer, and then the way he just develops on screen, he's there just trying to impress, impress a Morton Joe. And and let's get into a Morton Joe now, who's our main big bad for this film. 
Immortan Joe, I've mentioned it before, he is essentially the god, the Hitler of the Citadel. He's given them water, but hardly any amounts of it. Just as don't get greedy. And he's he runs his own world. All the war boys will do anything for him. He it's not spoil oh, it's it's hard to explain about Joe yeah, because it is. on the trailers you, you have this presence of the big bad guy. Mm. But the reality is that he's nowhere near as bad as you think. He reminded me a lot of Bane. Yeah, he's he's very sickly and it, I don't I'm guessing that's from the kind of fallout and radiation of the world they're in. Yeah, but it's just the the way I, I had him hyped up in my head, I thought he's gonna be this badass that's gonna be hunting them, which he does to yeah. a degree. But there's this there's the no final products where you don't actually see him do a lot. Mm. He's mainly And I, I'm I wanna get into that later with Immortan Joe. Um I think I mean, it's definitely one of the coolest looking villains I've seen in years. I mean, that picture that came out where he, he dons the metal kind of um, muzzle breathing mask. And he did, there were parts where he did remind me of Vader, actually. He's got this sort of um, breathing apparatus and you get like the deep breathing like Vader and he's got the very deep and, um, you know, terrifying voice. Definitely one of the coolest looking villains I've ever seen, but I just think I would have liked to have seen a little more time with Immortan Joe. I never got the sense that he was truly villainous. I think we could have seen some scenes, more scenes at the start with the Citadel, or we could have seen him killing someone or showing his power. As such, he kind of had the Darth Maul uh, mentality to me. He was cool looking, he sounded cool, but in terms of villainous activities that he did, wasn't really that many. No, and it's a shame because you get this opening scene of him putting his gear on, mm. and he kind of puts this rack on covered in war medals or something like that. Mm. But then there's just nothing happens with him. The only on-screen development you get with Joe is that the people that have been taken are important to him. That's essentially it. Mm. He was just there as we need a villain, let's have one. And then for the rest of the film, he drives a car. Yeah. And that's it, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all he does. I mean, you can compare him to the other Mad Max villains. For a start, it's the same actor who played Toe Cutter in the first Mad Max. They're different characters completely, but I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, you see, I didn't know that, and I, I find that amazing. I kind of want to go into... If I, I'll definitely see... I think I'm seeing this film again tomorrow, actually. I want to watch this film with that in mind now and pretend that he's the same character. After Toe Cutter gets... Um, you know, crushed in the first movie in, in that massive crash. I want to go in pretending that he had to wear this breathing apparatus to continue living, and that's a Morton Joe now. Yeah, and it's, it's great because it's just another George Miller reference, just like he did with Jedediah the pilot. Mm. He gave him two films of two different roles. This one makes more sense though than that one. That that other one was kind of confusing, and we talked about that in Beyond Thunderdome. Oh yeah, well, I mean, with this, you, you don't really see three quarters of his face plus there's not no this was a much better way of doing it I found plus there's almost 40 years between the original two mm. yeah but it, it was a bit of a letdown I thought there's no rule for the character because he just doesn't do a lot mm. I, yeah and that, that's my biggest problem with it I mean you've, you've sold me on the look and everything and you know what he could have been one of the best villains in a film we've seen since maybe Heath Ledger as the Joker but as it is He's just kind of a stock villain. Yeah, I think with Joe, it's the common. He's just there for the spectacle, and mm. it, it does suit the the film. It suits the world, but it's just you're right about the Darth Maul. He just didn't do anything to earn the status that he had. Mm. But you mentioned the spectacle. Let's get into which is pretty much the entire focus of this two-hour movie, the action, and. Wow. There were many times in this film where I think my jaw hit the ground. This is, without doubt, the best action I've seen in the film. <sighs> I'd have to give this some thought, but probably since the first Matrix movie. Um, the, I'd say it's better than the Matrix. Yeah, well, they're, they're very different. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's difficult to compare a martial art kind of film to this. If we're talking car chase action, oh god yeah, it's the best I've ever seen. 
and that I believe that eighty percent of this film was practical effects. Oh, it's believable. I mean, what I love about this, you're right. The two-hour car chase is magnificent in its own right. Mm. But what you get with this is old-school cinema. The most, oh, yeah. the most important thing I think leading up to this film's release was the rating. And mm. when it came out as a fifteen, I was like, get in, because this is a film that needs to be, and the violence you get from the originals is designed to be a fifteen-rated film. And what this does. It doesn't say oh, we've got an R rating. Let's just use it because it's rated R, like Kickasses and Kingsman. This only uses it when it needs to be used, and it mm. needs to be used a few times. We'll talk about that later on. Mm. But but I think it's it's still done in a very stylistic way, just as the original ones were. Exactly, and you have the sort of the opening shot essentially with Max looking over the wasteland, gets mm. in the car and drives off. Then you you have your first chase within a minute of screen time. And it's just awesome because, again, it's the cars and the way they're used. Each car has its own purpose, but for the action scenes... the per- mm. And if, if I had to bring up one problem with the action in this, it's, as the trailer shows, it's a constant chase across the desert with cars. I think it would have been cool for at least the middle action scene, or perhaps the end action scene, to be set in a different location. Um, maybe go to a more populated area and have something that doesn't involve cars because there were some parts in the action where I kind of felt it was getting a little bit samey but then right when uh, I was thinking I've seen this before they'd pull out pole vaulting henchmen or they'd show um, my favourite character in this movie and this is in the trailer the flamethrower guitarist (laughs) they'd throw in bits like that and it always kept it fresh just at the point where I thought this is getting a bit tiring and to keep, to maintain that level of high octane action all the way through without getting tired of it completely it, that just shows the the credit to George Miller's direction, I mean we've talked about other films like uh, Transformers where the entire last act of the movie for about an hour, hour and a half is just an action scene and you get bored of it. But with this, I think this is um, goes in line with the practical effects as well. Because you're so mesmerised with what's going on, it's almost like it's almost like a dance. It's like a dance of anarchy and machinery. That's the best way I can describe this movie. And the stunt work that went into it, I really hope that this film wins some awards at the Oscars for stunt work or whatever, because it really deserves it. Yeah, I think with this, it's split into three. Obviously, there's opening acts, middle acts, final acts, yeah. like every film. But the way this is done with the cars, your opening act is the one with the sandstorm at the end. Yeah. And that's its own chase in its right. It's them getting away and introducing the cars, and you introduce the film with that. So I thought that was awesome and on that one. Obviously, Max has chained up. But then what I like most is the middle act, because you're introduced to this tribe in the narrow mountains... Mm. and it's when the motorbikes come out and you can see this is clearly like amazing stunt work when they're just sort of flying over the top of the uh, truck just dropping bombs on them and it's just thought that okay they've got a motorbike's cool but the fact that they're, they're all just like obliterating the bombs as well it was just awesome and it was new because you hadn't had motorbikes up till that point then mm. you can look at the third act when you said about the swinging people there's nothing like that and the fact that they keep it quiet until the end because if you'd have had the same stuff in the opening fight, you would be fatigued at the end of it, just like the Hobbit films. However, mm. with this, it does keep it fresh, and it's the credit to George Miller as to why it's keeping fresh. And the practical effects, I mean, you get an old-school Mad Max when a car just goes straight into the front of a truck and explodes. You can see that that's a stunt car getting abolished. It's not just a CGI explosion popping away and nothing else. And I thought it was just like fantastic, and with with the violence again, it got its R rating, and it mm. used it when it needed to. I was just amazed that all this could be achieved. I would never think, and it's it could have been so easily all done in CGI, as is the kind of the modern way of filmmaking. But it's nice to see Miller kind of holding on to that old eighties late 70s style of filmmaking where everything you try and make everything practical and obviously the biggest cgi set piece of the movie is the 
the tor- the sand tornado from the trailer. But you allow that more. It, it's if if your film has a good blend of practical and CGI, you can blend the two perfectly, and that's what this film does. There might be a few other CGI shots, but none come to mind because the greater focus of the entire film is practical. Yeah, and it's one of them where you look at your Nolans. He only uses CGI when it's physically impossible to use practical effects, and this is exactly what George Miller does throughout the film. I mean, it could have been easy for the swing things to have been CGI, but no, they had them flying around. And it was awesome. And even the sandstorm in its own right, okay, it was CGI, but there was still a chase within, and you could just, you have this sense of entitlement where you know that they've actually had a chase and they're going to add this stuff in in post. They've they've clearly planned a chase scene for a sandstorm, and they've pulled it off, and it's, it's credit to the stunt drivers and all that because they'd have had to have timed it perfectly every little crash to make it look like they're getting whipped by the storm mm. and just the little things like uh, Furious is looking in the mirror quick cut, rock hits it and then that's your camera angle gone mm. and I thought the cinematography as well in this film was outstanding and they, oh it was beautiful and it was just it's I think it's the combination of the wasteland the sort of the cars the, all of it it was just watching a masterpiece. This was the most expansive we've ever we've ever seen the wasteland, I think. And it's not just that fact; it's the color in it. There was so much color in this film. I mean, the color palette for most modern day action films seems to be like gunmetal grey and muted colors. But this, and I got this impression from the trailer where um, the cars send up those. They almost look like they're flares of powder and you get the red and the yellow powder in the sky. Uh, there's just so much colour in this film and it, it just it just makes every frame of the film perfect. I mean, the last film I went to see where I probably just took in every single pixel of the image in or was probably Interstellar. Um, but I, this to me is more impressive to look at than Interstellar. Interstellar's still great, but I was wowed more by what I was seeing on screen with this one. And I mean, you haven't just got your action with this one. It's it's just aided with the um the great soundtrack as well. Oh. By Junkie XL. The soundtrack on this was amazing. I mean, Junkie XL, I don't know a lot about him, granted. Mm, same. But I know that he's part of the Hans Zimmer crew and that he's been given well, he's he's composing Batman v Superman with Zimmer next year because he's doing the Batman stuff. Mm. And uh, I, th- I think he worked with Hans Zimmer on the Amazing Spider-Man 2 soundtrack as well, which, granted, it wasn't a great soundtrack, but I, I could hear those Hans Zimmer orchestral motifs in this, and then you, it mixes with the kind of grungy electronic sound as well. Yeah, and it's, it's the drums. The drums are so yeah. important, and you can just the banging and it suits it because as much as you think oh this is just this action piece of just constant banging loud noises like Man of Steel this was completely different you'd have moments when there's pure silence or you'd have the strings on I mean there's a scene of Furiosa in the desert like kneeling down and they just have this powerful score in the background oh that was that was my favourite scene of the movie right there oh was it I loved that scene so yeah it, it was it was very good oh, it's, it's hard to pick a favourite scene can't do it. I mean, I, I was in love with that scene in the trailer, but just to see it in context in the movie with the oh, it was it was perfect. I loved that scene. Oh, it's a tough one. I mean, that took me off point. I'm trying to think what the best bits were. Well, we we don't want to go into it's, um, it's too hard, isn't it? Yeah, too it's, much. it's yeah, too we'll, hard. We'll, we'll do that later. Th- think about it and come back to it. Yeah, but I mean, just going back really quickly to Junkie XL. I mean, I know he comes from a DJ sort of background but to me this was right up there with some of the best soundtracks of the year without doubt or that I've heard in a while it just a good soundtrack is where it complements the film so well and the soundtrack just kept you in the action it was relentless but it 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 pulled it back when it it was at the more tender moments or the slower moments in between the film and it's it has made me really excited to see what kind of stuff he comes up with for um, Batman's theme in Batman v Superman that's, that's what I was leading on because I said you've got the Hans Zimmer aspects of it and when that combines next year I mean the banging of the drums if you're going to get Superman the Man of Steel Superman versus Batman 
then you can't think of a better pairing than him and Hans Zimmer. Mm. And I hope he continues to use that theme that Hans Zimmer wrote for Superman as well, because I don't think that got used enough in Man of Steel. No, but it kind of came at the end credits on that, didn't it? Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think it's in safe hands with him. He, he's, he's definitely one to watch as a composer. Oh yeah, he'll grow from this. Now he's got his his first big blockbuster out of the way. He'll have his big one next year. And then we'll see where he goes from that bar. I think he's got a good future and it was it's a fantastic soundtrack to listen to. Mm. And before we get into our spoiler section, there's just really one area I want to cover. We'll um, discuss uh, the 3D version of the film versus 2D. I saw it in 3D, you saw it in 2D. So um, do you want me to give my impressions of the 3D first and then see how it compares to yours? Or Yeah, but I'll quickly say that if anyone doesn't know that I'm very for 3D and you're you're not against it but you're not like bothered by it i suppose no um i'll only go and see a few select films in 3d um the ones that come to mind were avatar because everyone was saying this is the medium you have to see it in i saw gravity in 3d um but in between i've just seen a lot of films probably that have been converted and it just looks like a 2d film to me I just think, oh, okay, the background looks like it's more in the background. I could have told that if I just watch it in 2D. So I'm kind of a 2D purist, but I will go and see, almost begrudgingly see a 3D film if I think that that is the intended medium for it. Yeah, I think that's fair enough with me. I think if it's, you kind of said it there, and then if it's filmed in 3D, mm. I'll watch it. I'm more than X. I'm, I'm going to give it a chance. But with Mad Max, this is one that I really, really wanted to watch in 3D. Mm. And then, f- because of the stupid showings at my place, I end up seeing it in 2D. However, I will be seeing it next week. But when I was watching this, I knew within about 20 minutes that this is a film that should be seen in 3D. Yeah, and it, it's kind of weird as well, because um, yesterday I, I saw a review from someone saying that this was... This wasn't filmed in 3D, this was converted, and to avoid the 3D at all costs, because it was really bad. And I thought, oh great, well, 3D is the only showing I can make at the time it's you know, it's showing. So I, I kind of went in thinking, oh, this is going to be really bad, but I, I really, really enjoyed the 3D in this film. There's one shot in particular towards the end, and I'm not going to spoil it, but it's the complete money shot of the movie, and to the point where I was watching it and thinking well this scene's going to have to get cut out of the 2D version because it's just going to look ridiculous without the 3D attached to it and um, I I talked about this scene with you earlier and I think you know the scene I'm talking about so how did how did stuff like that compare in a 2D screening it was one of them where you saw the shot and it's like I need to see this in 3D it looks great now. This would look even better. Yeah. And I have this constant feeling that this would come up every hour or two. No, no, sorry, completely wrong words. Come up every like ten, fifteen minutes. There's just this like mm. perfect shot that I just keep thinking I want to see this in three D. The only positive I can say about seeing in two D over three D is that three D is naturally darker, and it mm. was, like as I've said before, it's beautiful, and it was just when it was bright. It looked awesome, you know. You, the color, the contrast. I know they do color grading based off color wheels, all that sort of stuff. But it looked so nice. But I did want to see it in three D more, and it's a shame I missed out because some of the stunts as well. Oh my god! If if you could see some of the the action flying into your eyes, I'd have I'd have loved it. Mm. The the darkness actually wasn't too bad on the three D. There were some shots mostly the opening of the film that's quite a dark and um, frantic scene and it took a while for my eyes to adjust to the film as it was so I may have missed a few bits out of that but I mean the camera pulls back enough to take in the landscape shots and stuff so I don't think I really miss anything there but I would like to see it in 2D just so I have that comparison or preference to it but I would definitely recommend the 3D if you're into 3D see it in 3D for sure um, but I don't think that seeing it in 2D took away from your overall experience did it oh no I still loved it it's not one of them yeah. like, it's not like Avatar Avatar and Gravity the only films I could think of where there's no point watching it without the format Mad Max mm. should still be seen in 2D if you don't like 3D fine but if you're willing to give it a go then do it on this film for sure 
Okay, so before we move into our spoiler section, I think we'll just give um, another brief general opinions of the movie, and then we'll start going into deeper territory with the film and get into spoilers. Do you want me to go first or you? Uh, yeah, yeah, you go first, man. Mad Max Fury Road is the best action film of the year. It's the, uh, wrong word. It's the best film of the year up to Star Wars comes out. It's one of the best action yeah. films of all time. And you will enjoy yourself. That's the most important thing. You're paying to watch entertainment and you will be entertained. If you're not entertained, then there's something wrong with you. Mm. Def- I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. I mean, I know I had a few problems with the movie, but overall, you go to a movie to be entertained and it's a form of escapism. And this film does exactly that. If you go in and you're just looking for really, really incredibly well shot, well paced, energetic, exciting action, this film will definitely not disappoint. If you're intrigued by the trailers, um, and you've never seen a Mad Max before, I'd definitely give it a shot because I think this is still, as it is, a good introduction into this world. Without You don't have, really have to see the older films before going in. Th- really, the only problems I had with it were that Tom Hardy perhaps didn't get as much focus as I would have liked, and it's it's just my yearning for more character development and a little bit more substance in what otherwise is a great summer action movie. Or action movie in general, I should say. Want to get through this? Let's go! Okay, so after that, we'll now move into our spoiler section. So if you haven't seen the film and you still... In, interested in seeing it you know turn this review off now and then come back to us or if you're not fussed about spoilers then you know just carry on watching one of the points i want to bring up is that and i had this kind of conflict before the film came out i wasn't sure if it was a reboot or a continuation of the series now after seeing the film i believe it's a reboot because they do some stuff with Max's backstory, which completely contradicts his backstory f- that's established in the first Mad Max film. And, and what that is, is throughout the film, he's haunted by visions of his daughter, who looks about um, 10 years old or something like that. Now, if you followed the series, you'll know that he didn't have a daughter. He actually had an infant son who was killed when a biker gang ran um, his son and his wife down. And that was the setup for his character, and that's why he snapped and became the Mad Max we know. Now, all of a sudden, this film introduces a daughter. So, to me, this is a complete reboot of the series because it's changed his backstory. And this is where we completely disagree. Mm. I think it is uh, the continuation. George Miller said it, and I believe it. Where you get the haunted scenes, yes, there's the one child in particular that comes back two, three times that does look like a girl, I give you that. My issue with this is that he has about ten people that come back to him in these flashbacks. Like, there's just this like old old guy who's just standing there, like, "Oh, he could have helped me." Then there's a group of people, "Oh, he could have helped us." And I just feel that it's just developing the character over the time and the waste on that he's met lots of people, and he's either screwed them over or he's just done different stuff. And I think it was right; it was wrong to focus on the one young person because it will confuse people. But I just don't believe that they would have talked about the kid because he had a wife as well. They would have surely brought up the wife if it was his kid because they died on the same day. But mm. I just believe that this was a sequel and they're just delving into the past of other people. Well, I thought that too, actually. When I first saw the girl, I was thinking, well, they're making it look like it's a daughter, but he didn't have a daughter. So maybe, and I thought exactly as you just said there, maybe this is kind of his reflection of the past of all the people, his he's ran into in the time we haven't spent with him since you know the 30 years of uh, between the films but then the little girl calls him pa or papa and on the uh, plot synopsis of the movie it says is haunted by visions of his daughter so if this is a reboot and the sequel's going to kind of delve into his past more through more flashbacks i guess i can get behind it but in terms of a continuation I just think it's irritating, especially because it's from the same creator, that he would choose to sort of retcon his own backstory with it. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, I just 
don't think if this was a reboot I think they would have fully rebooted it with a full origin introducing the world more I just still see this as a sequel in my eyes it's just set between 2 and 3 because obviously by the time he gets to the third film he's old but I, I can understand where you're coming from and it's an interesting one but I just this seemed too familiar territory to be a reboot hmm I mean, the the opening of the film is almost identical, or at least very reminiscent of the opening from Mad Max 2, which itself, although was a continuation, we talked about this as well, was more a soft reboot of the series, where we were introduced into a complete new world. And I mean, that did it exactly the same way, almost identical to this, where you get the montage at the start where there was a nuclear explosion and, you know, the political situation went to you know hell and all gangs rose up and then you have your opening desert chase which i will say i thought was kind of a cop out at the start of this film because mad max's car is just taken down with one spear i was expecting a bit more of a longer chase at the opening yeah i, I thought they could have done with a bit longer than that because it's when he gets in the car drives off they all chase after him like oh this is awesome mm. and then they kind of just get him straight away and it's a bit like oh i wasn't expecting that I can understand why they did it because they didn't want to peak too soon with their action for what was to come, but I just think it would have been a bit more of a stronger opening if we could have saw Max driving through the desert and maybe like a, a four or five minute long action scene at the start to get us into the world. Yeah, but I, I think what the, the scene does, it, it doesn't develop the character of Max, but it keeps him away, so for the, for the people that are unfamiliar with Mad Max, they, wouldn't, they just don't catch on to how much of a badass he is. Until mm. obviously, like he, when he gets caught, he kicks out, starts the fight, stuff like that. So it's it's, it's a weird one because I wasn't expecting the start of the film. However, I think it worked to its advantage. You don't they wanted to get into the the full car chase quickly, I believe, with the the rigs and stuff. So it's just like yeah. just like necessary opening stuff. If you look at all the advertising, it's him caught and in that mask and stuff. Yeah. So it it was one of them where I was I was expecting it to come early, but I just didn't think it'd be that early. And I mean, once the story gets going and he runs into um, Furio, so oh, that's that's just a really quick nitpicky bit I want to bring up about that too. Um, after the tornado in the desert and Mad Max gets pulled out of the car and he kind of wakes up in the desert, it just so happens that the big rig also stopped not quite far from where he crash landed. I thought that was a bit. Of um, I thought that was a bit easy just to get Mad Max to meet up with Furiosa. Yeah, it was, it's kind of it faded to black, and then when he woke up, I thought it'd be like a day or two later, and there was nothing. Mm. But it seemed like a five-minute nap because the convoy's still behind. Yeah, and one of the many fade to blacks in this film, by the way, that was definitely the most commonly used scene transition in this film. I felt like I was watching the end of Return of the King again. Well, it was weird because I thought it kind of signalled the end of like the first act, second act, but then they use it two or three times towards the end, which was too much. Yeah, definitely. But it works well in its favour at the beginning, I thought. And then eventually when he runs into um, Furiosa and the wives, and I know you wanted to talk a lot more in depth on this and the concept of feminism with the characters, and definitely one of the wives in particular. Yeah, this is where I really struggled in the main review because it's impossible for me to speak about this without spoilers. So we get the wives who were all the prized possessions of Immortal and Joe. Yeah. And Rosie Huntington Whitley, who everyone knows as the English woman of Transformers 3, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And I'm not going to lie, she's a terrible actress. She's pregnant yeah. in this, so luckily she's at, she doesn't actually do anything. I, I quite enjoyed her character to a degree, because when, especially in blockbusters and high-budget films... They don't like these nasty endings. What does George Miller do? He has a mm. group of women, one of them which is heavily pregnant, and I thought was giving birth at one stage. Yeah. And he chucks her out the side of a car and has her run over by a gigantic buggy. And then, say so like, oh shit, he's done it, he's killed them. This is not what you think of a blockbuster film. You think, oh yeah, her pulse is still going. Check the baby. Think, oh, here we go. The baby's gonna live, it's gonna become the next thing, mm. and then the baby's dead itself. And I thought it was brilliant because they start, they don't make jokes out of it, but they use the umbilical cord as like a toy. 
And yeah. they just like dissect this common Hollywood belief where your happy endings don't exist anymore. And you kind of get that with the wives in it. And it's interesting because it just goes against every stereotype you could possibly imagine for a blockbuster that involves pregnant people. And that, oh, definitely. And that's just typical of Mad Max films because I always said, in the first one, I never expected the wife and son to die. But they did it mm. on screen. They did it in a nasty way. This ending's probably worse than that because you actually see her go under the car and the crash it causes. My one problem with that is, though, after that happens, we get a shot of a Morton Joe holding a body, and I'm sorry, but there would be nothing left of that body. Oh, no, that that's what annoyed me because it was like this perfectly stable body when the reality was yeah. it would have been like crushed blood everywhere. Yeah, but, you know, it's, we wouldn't have got that scene afterwards otherwise, and this kind of harkens back to the first Mad Max film, when we see um, the sort of surgeon uh, sharpening the knives ready to dissect her, any other film would show that happening and be a really horrific, gory scene. And although there is violence in this film, Miller knows when to show violence and when not to because it's stronger from the audience's imagination. Because the audience's imagination can go to far greater lengths than any scene can be shown in a film. Yeah. And um, that's the thing with George Miller. He doesn't hold back, and that's what makes him stand out. Mm. And if, did you have anything else to say with the female characters in this film? Because, I mean, later on in the film, they run into the... Oh, I forgot the name of the group of them. But the older women in the desert um, who lived um, in the old homeland where Furiosa's character came from and was kidnapped from. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting how they used them because... Again, it goes against blockbuster stereotypes. You have the older people who have been through the wars, and what do they do? They give them all plenty of weapons, motorbikes, and have them in the finale. And again, George Miller doesn't hold back. He has some of them executed in nasty ways. There is one of them where they kind of hide under a car, and then the woman gets up proud of herself, and yeah. the next thing you know, she just gets obliterated. And it was awesome because you get this sort of emotional response it's like oof that's nasty and then you kind of think it goes thank god because that would happen if you're being chased by this crazy gang of people you are going to get slaughtered so mm. it's just interesting of them to bring in these new characters and kill them off and you know I still really liked these characters and they added quite a, a needed bit of levity towards the end I found some of their quips and um interactions with the younger wives in it were pretty funny I found and I, I kind of wish that it got more to do in the action scenes really I mean we established that they've got this fleet of motorcycles and I think it could have made the end action scene a bit more visually interesting I mean you had your first uh, car chase scene you have your second one in almost exactly the same type of landscape and your third one as well I think the third one could have been split up where maybe Max chooses to drive the truck on his own and uh, to distract the rest uh, to distract um, Immortan Joe's crew but then you also have the chase happening on the bikes as well so you could have cut between the two of them yeah that was another annoying part because one of the things I love is the motorbikes I've said before and mm. I've, you can't beat a good motorbike chase in a film and when you get the sixth, you're like, here we go, we're going to get something amazing here. But you only got one of them, and they're the ones that died very quickly. Yeah, and it, it would have just been... I mean, we've seen buggies before, and we've seen big rig trucks before, and especially because most of the film is that, I think it would have just been kind of nice to see. I mean, the bit where the second chase in the Canyon Ravine is awesome bike stuff. I mean, the stunts like flying over the bike, dropping the petrol bombs on top of the truck. That was great, and I just think if you'd have t taken that to the open wasteland landscape for the end chase, it would have been just equally, if not more awesome as well. Yeah, and that's what I wanted because it wasn't any of the trailers of the motorbikes. I didn't expect it to come, and then when they came in, I just didn't want them to stop, but then instead, they take away the stuff you like the most and they improve it by putting the I don't know what you'd call them you know when they from the third one the pole vault in that's the one pole vaults yeah that was one of the most genius inventions they did on this film oh oh definitely and I, I said earlier it's almost like a dance yeah you're almost watching a dance with how meticulously this must have been planned and framed and I can't even imagine the storyboards for this film it's 
watched. It's it was a, literally a joy to watch, and there's so much going on on the screen. I feel like um, the behind the scenes on Phantom Menace. Every scene is so dense. There's so much going on in it, but although it's chaotic, it doesn't get too over the top. It's still you could still take in everything that's happening. And I think this will be a great film for repeat viewing, so each time you can focus on a different driver or different aspect of the screen. Definitely. And then another thing I want to speak about, Morrison Job. He said he didn't do enough, which he Mm. didn't. He didn't actually... I don't think he killed anyone. No, and that was my problem. I think if you'd have started off, especially in the Citadel, because I'm going to get into this, I don't think Immortan Joe is really a villain of this film. I mean, if you take out of the equation that he treats women a little badly, if we take that out, he's still created this empire of people, he's got all these civilians, he's feed, he's, um, giving them water regularly, he's not giving them much, but then again, you can't give them too much because then you waste the supply of the water you've got. He's given them just as much as they need to survive. He's created an order, he's given people purpose. All these um, war boys look up to him and when they go into battle they ride for him and then this is one of my biggest problems of the film as well Um, when Charlize Theron has that realisation that yeah maybe the place I wanted to leave at the beginning wasn't so bad after all and then they go back there yeah Uh, do do you want to carry on that bit no no I was just I've basically said everything I just don't think Immortan Joe was that villainous if you'd have had a scene where maybe after he only gives the um, population a little bit of water, if we'd have seen him maybe be a real glutton with it and or feed the war boys loads of water or put it in their cars whilst other people are dying of thirst, that would have shown a bit more of the um, dictator quality to him, like you mentioned earlier. Or perhaps, you know, he kills someone who questions him. Or what you could have done which would have been which would have made him really diabolical is we've established that he's got these few women caged in a safe um for his own horrible uses maybe we could have had it where he'd taken all of the women and got them in cages and the men were kind of kept down or weakened or he'd only feed them or he'd only give them a little bit of water just to survive so they couldn't rise up and then the ending of the film could have been where uh, Max frees them all and they all, you know, get their freedom at the end. Uh, see, my issue with the Immortan Job is that, yes, he's painted as this light. However, there is a lot of water there and you can see him. He gives it for a little bit, stops the water and says, oh, don't get greedy. He goes into sort of rant. And, okay, he's done them some good, but you know that he's been kidnapping them the wives are blatantly like obviously just good looking people that is in his area and it's when uh, Furiosa her role is just to go into that town and just take some oil um, not oil uh, fuel he, mm. and for all we know it probably is more like Mad Max but she's going to go and kill people and take stuff because he sends out armoured trucks with her and I, I thought he's a, he's a villain that could have been ten times better. You're right that he's not painted as a proper villain. However, yeah. you still have this presence of the fact that he's intimidated by everyone. A few of them look up to him as a hero. But it summed it all up when they bring back his dead body. And they're all ripping parts off. All the mad boys go for a... Uh, they're like, oh yeah, they let them up. They they have no loyalty. They just care about whoever's in charge. It seemed like it was more of a survivor of the fittest rather than a leadership. Mm. Well, what confused me about the ending was, though, that even though he only gave them a little bit of water, they all still looked up to him as a god. They all absolutely idolised him, every single person at that citadel. And then at the end it was like, oh, no, actually, we hated him anyway. Yeah, but... I thought that bit was a bit hastily done, perhaps. I don't know, it's... It's an interesting one because we don't get enough time in the citadel, I think. Because in the citadel, you see lots of grass and stuff like that. However, they don't give any of that out. You don't see the public with them. You see starving people in nasty clothes. You know, people with like one leg running out of holes. It seems like he treats people incredibly bad still, but he gives them this tiny bit of relief. And it just came across as me when I was thinking of it a bit like Hitler before World War Two. He kind of did some good, but behind the scenes it was not good at all 
it, it's an interesting opinion because I never thought of it that way that this one was a god. Mm. But it's hit and miss. I just don't think he was developed well enough. That's because the whole film is about Max and Furiosa rather than Joe. Mm. But I, I, def- I agree with you. I definitely would have liked perhaps um, ten minutes more in um, at the beginning at the Citadel just to establish the kind of um, rule and the quality of the mind of the people and just to see a bit more of the world I think that it seemed like the film was like okay come on come on let's get to the um, let's get to the car chase as quick as we can because that started off a hell of a lot quicker than I expected it to in the film yeah and I think maybe the film if it had had just a few more minutes at the beginning it may have benefited more and we could have got to know Immortan Joe a little bit more I know what they're doing if they're doing a comic prelude series called Immortan Joe Oh, are they? I was just reading about that, yeah. So uh, we might get a, f- a lot more backstory where it says that he was like a sort of general or something like that. It's his rise to power. But you know, that's kind of the Star Wars prequel thing with um, General Grievous. You can have your comic books and expanded universe and all that stuff, but it's it's what's in the film that counts. Exactly. And he he just needed a few more minutes. That's all it would have took. It was it was almost there because there was a bit in the film where I genuinely felt sorry for him, where um, Rosie Huntington Whitley dies, and um, he's holding the body. I almost did feel sorry for him because you know he is, although by via diabolical means, all he wants to do is just create you know a new population and look look towards his people. I wouldn't say he wanted a new population. He just wanted a boy because the really big guy with the machine gun—that's his son. Yeah. But he just doesn't look at him as one because he says, oh, I wanted the perfect one. That's why, obviously, all the wives were, like, good-looking people. So I still think he's this, like, nasty guy. I just... I don't really have sympathy towards him. I just think he's an undeveloped undeveloped villain that should be a lot better. Which mm. was sad, but I, I would admit that his death was awesome. Oh, it was so good. But he just, like, ripped off, and then they used blood to their advantage in this, I thought. Where they don't show it on screen but it's like heavily implied that you just see this bright flash of red and then suddenly the chain's off and so is his face yeah and they just leave it in the corner of the shot blurred just his remains and I thought it was awesome oh yeah and the rapid cut as well oh uh, yeah which just speaks to the structure of it and you d- obviously you don't see his mouth get ripped out but the, the the pace of the edit and obviously you cotton on to the fact that you know what's going on and it was just such a we- good way of getting rid of your villain definitely I thought it, it, it was a great villain's death rather than a pathetic one which we've seen a few times in these Mad Max films um but yeah I don't th- I don't think I can think of anything else to say really for spoiler section I think we've done a good job of covering it all really yeah I, I think it's yeah, I, I guess think... we could speak about the ending more where um, after Mad Max establishes order and uh, Charlize Theron gets back. Actually, that's a point I'd like to make. Um, yeah, I didn't like the fact that they um, they go on this huge quest to find a new promise. Uh, the Greenland, I believe they call it. Yeah. Um, and then it turns out they just want to double back to the place they came from at the end. I thought that was a bit of a cop-out. Also... It, the film makes it seem like they travelled for days, maybe even weeks across this wasteland to get to where they needed to, and then just when they need to go back to the Citadel at the end they do it in about a 10-15 to 15 minute long car chase Oh yeah, the car chase was about 15 minutes but that's just as they enter the canyon I think they would have had a nice easy ride home after that mm. What I think they implied with that was she said about when he said it would take us about a day to get back if we go the way we came but I think at the end of the day once that car chase is done and dusted with the fight they're not going to show any footage of them just driving home on a nice little day out mm. but it worked to its advantage and what I did like was rather than have Max become this god of this clan and stuff you got like a traditional Mad Max ending with him on his own leaving because yeah. it's, it kind of sticks to that narrative where the Mad Max films are someone else telling the story of Max. Obviously, it's not blatant, but it's heavily implied, and that ending kind of does it. Where this like mythological character just kind of goes his separate ways again, and I thought that was that was a good ending for it. I did like it, but I did question why he left the group because 
where we leave Mad Max at the end of the other films, it's kind of justified that he carries on on his own to find his path. I mean, the end of the first one, his wife and child are murdered and he's just driving aimlessly because he has nothing left in the world. At the end of two, um, I believe he establishes order but just carries on anyway, or he gets separated from them. The end of three, he's just left on his own in the desert, so he's got to carry on. But I mean, here he got a civilization given to him. Um, Furiosa clearly had some feelings for him, if not completely romantic, but they had that kind of bond with each other. Um, he had fresh water, he had vehicles, he had a population of people. It seemed like he'd found everything that he'd need. So I do question the fact why he decided to, you know, part ways with her at the end. Yeah, I think he just didn't want that life where right? mm. he kind of said it before when he talked about Hope saying that there's nothing and in his head we know that it's. I think it's his speech at the start where he kind of says that he just can't have anything. Mm. So I think if you'd have him having happiness like that it just wouldn't work in his favour. So it's better off to keep him as the anonymous figure. Yeah, but um, yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. I've I've said everything I want to on the film. Um, I still really enjoyed the film. These were just a few of the nitpicks I had, but still a solid, solid movie, and I would definitely highly recommend seeing it and see it on the big screen for God's sake. You know, you could if you see this on the small screen, it's going to take away a lot of the experience. Oh, this needs to be seen. Yes, uh, the screening at my cinema was the small screen, which was a real shame, but it was still awesome. The biggest, I mean, this is an IMAX film for sure. And it'll be interesting to see the reception this film gets, as well as how much it makes, because obviously this isn't this is a non-Marvel property. So it'll be interesting to see if it makes um, equal or just slightly under as much money as some of the Marvel films have, and shows that this series is getting love. I think this is going to get about, based off word of mouth, this can hit about five fifty, six hundred mil worldwide. I think. <laughs> Yeah, I would say about 600 million. I mean, I'm looking at Rotten Tomatoes now. It's got 147 fresh reviews, two rottens. Mm. So it's really in its favour. And you know what? I, I hope it does because although it's a fourth instalment of a franchise, it's still very much an original concept. Oh, yes, definitely. There are some things on here where they could have, you know, they could have done another Thunderdome match. They could have had the the Citadel being like a base like the second film but they went for something new they went for civilization they went for a crazy car chase mm. and awesome guys on stilts in a swamp land which was one of my favourite bits of the movie <sighs> I know it, it just kind of came out of nowhere then it was there for like three four seconds I was like what and then boom yeah it's, it's, it's just done it just epitomised Mad Max and George Miller himself and we need to support films like this and hopefully this show this brings in a new trend in action movies cuz boy do we need it yeah definitely as the as the world fell each of us each of us in our way was broken it was hard it was hard to know more crazy crazy me me as the world fell each of us in our way but anyway Getting on to our instalment of Film Fights. This is our second instalment we introduced this week. This is where we take a character or situation from our movie news section and cross it over and pit it against something from our main review. Last week, we crossed a fight with Boba Fett versus Mad Max. And last week, Boba Fett won that fight. This week, we're doing something a little different with this. What have we got this week? Well, because there's essentially no decent news... Yeah. <laughs> we, we've had to take a, a different concept which is actually rather awesome and it's would you rather be a sort of human in the planet of the apes the apes conquered the world or would you be in the sort of Mad Max wasteland knowing that there's gangs coming to kill you rape you all that sort of stuff so it's an interesting one because it's kind of you, you lose either way you're being hunted either way and controlled by horrific gangs. One's a gang of apes, one's a gang of crazed car driving madmen. So, uh, why don't you take this one first? I want to hear what you have to say on this because I've got some thoughts on this one. For my safety, I'd pick the apes, but I want to go to the wasteland. <laughs> you just want to be in the wasteland? I just want to go around and drive a car for a bit. I mean, obviously, I'd join a crew, so I'd be fine. 
Oh, but yeah. it would just be so fun. <laughs> Especially if it's the the wasteland for Mad Max Fury Road, definitely. I'd probably be the guitarist strapped to the front of the truck. Exactly. Um, exactly. There's there's unlimited possibilities in that too, Rav. If you're going to go with apes, then you're going to be locked in a cage. You know, yeah. you, you're just in for a, a bad X amount of months. If you escape, you'll die with this. If you escape, you can drive away. If we're going with the world of the apes that are established in the recent films, I think they show a little bit more compassion. And maybe I could hang out in a Caesar's treehouse home with his family and his, his friends and his ape people. Um, Mad Max is just relentless. There is no rest. You've got to keep travelling every day. You're fighting for fuel. You're fighting for water, for sustenance. You can't really trust anyone because you know everyone's out for themselves in that world. Whereas with apes, you kind of have that connection with people because they're in the same situation as you and apes are the enemy but you know I, I'm pretty confident that I could get in Caesar's good books so with this fight I am gonna say that I would rather live in a world ran and controlled by apes see uh, it's, it's the way it's done for me I think it's definitely the way it's done I mean with the apes at the end of the second film he turns away the humans because he knows he can't be with them this is def that you definitely don't want to be with apes. You want to be in the wastelands because you're at least going to find people. You can have a chat with them, or if, <laughs> or, or if you feel like you're going to lose, you just join the uh, the clans because that that way you'll at least be with people. I'm I'm going to hang out with a Morton Joe and ride with him to the gates of Valhalla. Well, exactly, and it's just like, oh my god, he start he stared at me, and it's just like. <laughs> I do want to be in that car or banging the drums on the back of the guitar thing. Oh yeah, that. yeah, just spray paint your teeth silver. Oh, that was that was weird but cool. Yeah. Oh, so this is our first draw this week. I know. That's an interesting this is, one. It's kind of weird. Hopefully, some of the viewers can comment and decide, and you know, pit this one way or the other. But right now, we have a draw between a world of the apes or the wasteland from Mad Max. Comment below, let us know which you'd rather live in. But you, you made some great points there. You almost swayed me over to the wasteland for a second. I know. I can't believe I thought I'd pick it. and It was just there. An hour of talking, I had to pick it. Oh, yeah. But anyway, this was our main show for this week. This was a really great conversation here because we hadn't talked about this. So it was nice getting a bit of contrasting opinions on a few aspects of the film. But I think overall we both really enjoyed it. And there is one final thing. Oh yes, I almost forgot. We move on to our segment of nominating a movie. It has to be vaguely tied in to our main review for this week, so obviously it has to tie in with Mad Max Fury Road. I picked last week and picked Dread, so it's your turn this week, George. So what are you going to pick and what are your reasons for picking it? So it's tied in with Mad Max Fury Road. It's a Tom Hardy film. Okay. And it's arguably the best sporting film of the past five, ten years, maybe, tied with Rush. It's Warrior. Oh, this is a great film. Oh, have you seen it? I, ha I, have, I have seen this film, yeah, <sighs> but it's been a while. It is without. It was awesome, and there's so much backstory to it. But I, I think Tom Hardy gives one of his best performances again, because there's not a lot of dialogue. He kind of just turns up and he's just this like, beast. But it's a fantastic film. It's. It got a few Oscar nominations as well, I believe, so that was always nice, but it's a great film, and I just don't know a oh, lot of people definitely. have seen it. I don't know anyone that disliked it. Yeah, same. Um, I'm going to love re-watching this film. I definitely need to. It's been probably a few years since I last saw it, but it's it's a really great character piece, and I think this will there'll be a really interesting review to do. Definitely very different from some of the last ones we've done, so I look forward to reviewing that. You'll be able to find that review on Thursday. But this was the end of our main show. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow us on iTunes now if you search up Cinema Savvy Movie Podcast. You can find us on podomatic.com if you search in cinemasavvy.podomatic.com. We're on Facebook and Twitter as well, forward slash cinema savvy or cinema underscore savvy for Twitter. Comment, spread the word, because the channel's growing. We're bringing you more reviews each week, and, you know, this is just good fun to do. Um, we love talking movies, and that's that's what we're in it for so be sure to come back thursday for our warrior review 
And until next time, thanks for listening. Goodbye.